Well, as Terrell already mentioned, uh, we have been walking through the Psalms. So we've been hitting on Thanksgiving, confession, and lament. And this week, we're bringing our focus in on petitions, bringing our requests to God. And we think about petitions and really just prayer in general. I think it can bring up a lot of different emotions, a lot of different places that all of us are currently in. I think for some, we might identify similar to Adele, who says, hello, can you hear me? Others, I think my favorite, the one I relate more to, is my favorite band, and they have a way of putting it that I think uh, really speaks to where my heart goes to at times. It says, do I anger you with my pestering? Could my questions call to arms the Prince of Peace? Does your heart grow cold, your affections wane? Could these unrelenting waves exhaust your flame? Could the God who bore my cross not bear this weight? A lot of us wrestle with things. We bring requests to God and then we have different emotions because we have different feelings about what we're hoping happens when we bring these requests to Him. And in this all, we bring requests to God because we understand He's there. He exists. He is the provider and sustainer of all things. But also, we are seeing our own inadequacy. I've seen so many things this week. I have a friend whose dad is currently in the hospital And there's a fear and concern that he might have brain damage to where he might never come back from that. He's currently on a ventilator, and there's a huge amount of unknown and concern. There's nothing in my power to resolve or be the answer and solution to them. I don't even have the words to say to encourage and comfort them. So I turn to God in prayer. There's big decisions in our lives that can have massive implications, and there's not necessarily a right and a wrong. There's just an unknown, and we're trying to walk in wisdom. And so we turn to God in prayer. We don't have the knowledge, the power, the understanding, or the words at times. And we have this opportunity to come to God in prayer. Ever since sin entered the world, mankind has experienced this need, this struggle, this pain, and unknown. And when we turn to ourselves rather than to God in prayer, or when we turn to others to be our hope, it's going to result in weariness, anxiety, fear, doubt, foolishness, and ultimately hopelessness. But God meets us in that, and he offers a better way. See, I have one hope for today. There is one thing that I hope you leave here with. My hope is that each person in this room leaves acting more like a child. I want everyone leaving here acting more like a child. And before all the kids in the room get really excited, thinking donuts are for lunch and video games are going to be played all day, Let's dive into the passage to understand what I'm meaning. So turn to Psalm 86 that Terrell just read from. We're going to start in the first verse. Psalm 86, 1. We're going to start with the first part of it. It says, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. Right from the beginning, David, who has penned this psalm, is addressing the Lord God. And he uses the name for God, Yahweh. This is the existing one, the one true God. It's a personal name of God. If we go to Exodus 3, 14 through 15, this is where God is speaking to Moses. And he says to Moses, Say to the Israelites, the Lord, that's Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name by which I am to be remembered from generation to to generation. So not only does his name convey that God is self-existent, but it also displays, and David is showing this at the beginning, that our God is near to us. He is present with his people. He is intervening on their behalf. And so as he starts there, he then continues, and he showcases three different things that are true about what David believes of God. Three things that are essential for us in our prayers and petitions to him. The first is that he believes that God hears We see him say in verse 1, incline your ear to me, O Lord. We see later he says, listen to my plea. And then further on, he's going to say, I call upon you, for you answer me. He believes that God hears. And second, he believes that God is able. As we go through Psalm 86, there are so many descriptions of the Lord. He is gracious, he is good, he is forgiving, he's abounding in steadfast love. He says, you answer me in my trouble when we call. There's none like him nor any works like his. He is great and he does wondrous things. 
It says that he alone is God, and he has delivered his soul from the depths of Sheol. So we see not only does his belief about God being able tie to truths about the Lord that he has heard and understood, but it also includes things he has experienced of God saving him, rescuing, answering him in his prayers. And that bolsters his confidence that God is able. So we see that God hears, that God is able, and David's understanding these things. And lastly, he believes that God cares. He describes him as merciful and gracious as faithful, and he says, great is your steadfast love toward me. Throughout Psalm 86, David is lifting the Lord high. He's exalting him for his greatness and his attributes that he has observed and that he has experienced. And it's important for us to see because the more rightly we understand who God is, the more fervent and bold we will be in our prayers. The more rightly we understand who God is, the more fervent and bold we will be in our prayers. You see, our God, his strength is inexhaustible. His knowledge is complete. His faithfulness is certain. His grace has no floor. His truth is reliable. His mercy is unwavering. His righteousness is pure and his love is steadfast. In all of these, he is holy. He's the Alpha and Omega, the Lord of all, and his ways are higher and better than anything we can fathom. These are just a sampling of the truths of who our God is, and they reveal and remind us of his greatness. And even in his holiness, he's a personal God. David is exalting how big our God is, and yet he is in this very beginning saying, incline your ear, listen to my plea, you hear my prayer. I hope that we will marvel more about the profoundness of this reality and delight in the security, the hope, the peace, and the comfort that should bring to our soul, that we have a God who is greater than all things. He's the creator of all things, and he hears our cries. He hears our pleas. So we have to start there when we start considering our petitions, why we even pray in the first place. We have to remember who our God is. But then we have to go to the next piece of the puzzle. It doesn't stop with our understanding of who God is. In order for us to be inclined to bring ourselves to pray to God, to bring our petitions and requests to him, we have to understand who we are. So back to Psalm 86.1, the second part of the verse. He says, Incline your, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Poor and needy. He goes on, a couple verses, or the very next verse, calls himself a servant of God. He says it multiple times in this passage. So he's poor and needy, and he calls himself God's servant. You see, to be poor and needy means to be without supply of our needs. You're poor. You cannot supply your needs. But also, when you're needy, it means that we are fully aware that we have needs. You have something that you have to call on someone else to supply. He is poor and needy, and we are poor and needy. It makes me think back to Ryan's description from last week of the beggar holding out his hand. That is the reality for all of us. We hold out our hand to the Lord, understanding that we cannot provide on our own. We must trust him for provision. We have wants and needs we can't supply. We are unable on our own. You are unable on your own. It's a reality that I think a lot of us believe intellectually, and yet when, a, when we bring it down to a functional level, we completely act opposite of that. You see, we were never created to live this life on our own. From the beginning, we see in Genesis, we were created to be abiding and walking with our Creator, the sustainer of our life, and abiding in fellowship with Him, depending on Him for everything. He is the source of our life, and He's also the sustainer of our life, whether we acknowledge it or not, every moment. But sadly, I fear many in this room are living as functional atheists. We live as though we are rich rather than poor and self-reliant rather than needy. We proclaim God on Sunday morning, but we live the rest of our days and our hours as if he isn't present, as if he isn't active in every moment, as if he doesn't care about the little things as well as the big in our day. And this is either foolishness or pridefulness, but either way, it's not going to produce anything good in our lives. And I'm sure if you pause to reflect on it, you would see the bad fruit that comes from living this way. So the question comes, how do we incline our hearts to God and live in this way? How do we incline ourselves to depend on him and come to him with our requests ceaselessly, boldly, fervently? 
Well, the answer is that we come to him and act like children. Turn to Matthew 6, 7 through 9. Matthew 6, 7 through 9. There it's Jesus speaking to the disciples, and here's what he says. He says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We see our Father right there. Jesus mentions it, repeats it twice. He's modeling what prayer should be like for the disciples. In contrast to the spiritual elite who pray elegantly to be seen or heard, or the Gentiles who heap up empty phrases, children of God get to come to their Father in simplicity, in honesty, and in humility. You see, Christian maturity stands in contrast to the way we view maturity in this world. In this world, we expect kids to get older and to become less dependent on us, to move out of that house and provide for themselves. All right, That's what we expect of kids. But in contrast, as Christians mature, we become more and more aware of our needs and our inability. We become more dependent, not less, and we bring more requests, not less. The more mature we come, the higher we understand who God is, and the more aware we are of our inability and our need for Him throughout our day. So how should this impact the way we pray? Well, Paul Miller puts it this way. He says, Jesus wants us to be without pretense when we come to him in prayer. Instead, we often try to be something we aren't. We begin concentrating on God, but almost immediately our mind wanders off in a dozen different directions. The problems of the day push out our well-intentioned resolve to be spiritual. We give ourselves a spiritual kick in the pants and try again, but life crowds out prayer. We know that prayer isn't supposed to be like this, so we give up in despair. We might as well get something done. What's the problem? We're trying to be spiritual, to get it right. We know we don't need to clean up our act in order to become a Christian, but when it comes to praying, we forget that. We, like adults, try to fix ourselves up. In contrast, Jesus wants us to come to him like little children, just as we are. We get to come to him just as we are. So what should this look like? What should the reality and the posture of being like a child for God do for our prayers and our petitions? Well, first, let's ask the question. Every parent in this room will answer this very quickly. What do children ask for? Everything. They ask for every little thing. They have so many requests and petitions. We see this in Psalm 86. David requests many different things all at once. He's bouncing around. He's focusing on a present need that he has. He's asking for God's deliverance and provision. But then he's also asking for God to gladden the soul of his servant. Prayers that seem like a daily request that he is coming before God with. They bring everything. And that is the way we are to do as well. We don't consider, we shouldn't consider what is worth asking for or the importance of our request. We need to just make it known. We don't need to overthink this. Secondly, how often should we ask for things? Repeatedly. Yet again, every parent in the room understands this. Ask repeatedly. This is something that Jesus even himself teaches. He he encourages them to be like this widow who comes repeatedly. We are to ask constantly and with perseverance because our Lord hears our cries. We can come to him and we can trust that he cares. Third, we can ask with faith and trust. See, children are confident of their parents' love and their power, sometimes overconfident in their parents' love and power and ability. They trust them with their requests to listen and to consider. As Charles Spurgeon put it, great as God is, he loves his children to be bold with him. We get to be bold with God. Like we talked about earlier, when we understand the greatness of our God, we can come with boldness because he is able And he cares, and he loves, and he wants to listen and hear what we have. And, like Jesus already put it in the passage we just read, he already knows. And we get to come to him with those things. So we get to pray with boldness and faith, and we have to seek to remember who God is, what he has done, and what he has promised. And then lastly, we ask relationally. And this means it's going to be raw and it's going to be unpolished. We get to come to God as we are, and it's okay that things are bouncing from thing to thing. Again, we see this in David. He goes from petition to praise, to thanksgiving, 
to more remembering and describing of what's happening and then praise again and then more petition, we get to come to God relationally. It doesn't have to be this formulaic approach. There's no method to our prayers that's prescribed in Scripture. We get to come to Him and pray. We get a model for what that prayer can involve from Jesus and from other areas too. And yet we're called to just come as we are as children. So ask relationally. So we ask for everything. We ask repeatedly. We ask with faith and a boldness that trusts the Lord. And we ask relationally. Now let's go back to Psalm 86, verse 4. Here we're going to see David use another name for God that showcases his heart posture. This child's heart posture toward their parents is what we're going to see, just in a different way. He says, Gladden the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Gladden the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Here we see another name for God that David uses. Instead of Yahweh, he uses the name Adonai. Adonai is a name for God that implies relationship, that God is Lord and that we are his servants. When this name is used, it evokes an understanding that God's will should be done. It's a submission to him and not our own will. It humbles the heart to surrender and submit to him. And what type of Lord do we have? Do we have a Lord who is demanding and overbearing, or do we have a Lord who is gracious and kind and loving? We know that answer is that we have a good Lord, and we're going to see that in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's a lightness, a joy, a rest that comes from turning to our Lord with our petitions and our requests. And you know, as many times as I've read and heard this verse, I almost always skim over a key part in the middle of it. And that's where he says his command to learn from him, to learn from Jesus. And so we're going to do that very thing right now and turn to another passage, Mark 14, 34 through 36. So if you turn there, Mark 14, 34 through 36. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples in anguish. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. We see here that Jesus is being real with the request to the Father while already knowing the answer, which seems just crazy to us. We do not understand the depths of this. He's praying, though, in a tension that we do understand and feel. We know that God is able. We know that he's able, but we also know that doesn't mean his answer is going to be yes. So we always wrestle with this tension of wanting to keep praying, wanting to keep requesting, but knowing that God's answer might not be yes. It might be no. It might be wait. And so we see Jesus begin here by proclaiming a truth about God. All things are possible. All things are possible. So again, back to that, he understands who God is. He's showcasing to us and displaying the grandeur of our Lord. And then he brings his request in his anguish. anguish. He says, remove this cup from me. But then he concludes with the final piece that is essential for our prayers. He says, yet not what I will, but what you will. Yet not what I will, but what you will. He brings his request to the Father, but he trusts in the Father's plan, the Father's goodness, and the Father's purpose. And this is the way that we can find greater joy in our prayers, greater perseverance and boldness. We can be raw and real with our requests to the the creator, the sustainer, and the provider of all things. But we have to also fight for the humility to submit those requests to his good, righteous, and perfect plans for our prayers. We have to submit those things to his will and trust him in that. See, Jesus is submitting his feelings to the Father's will. He's submitting to the story that the Father is weaving. James describes this tension in the ditches that we can turn into as well in our prayer life. In James 4, 
He says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. He gives two ditches here. One is not asking. The second is asking selfishly. You see, we're invited to bring all our requests to God, to be raw with our feelings, our desires, and our needs, but we have to also seek to pray in humility. So the ditch we don't want to turn into is to not ask out of assumption or belief that things aren't important enough or that we can do it on our own. But then we also must not ask selfishly as if we can demand things of God, as if we know what is good and right and best. We have to submit those things to him and understanding that his ways are higher and better. There's one more truth that should transform the way we understand our petitions being received by our Father in heaven. One more reality that we must cling to and understand that's going to help us to desire and long for and understand the beauty of the fact that we get to bring our petitions to our Heavenly Father. In John 15, 16, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask my Father in my name, he may give it to you. How does he tell them to ask? He tells them to ask the Father in his name. Now, why is that important? It's important because our God is a holy God. Because of our sin, we had no access. We couldn't draw near. But as Ephesians 2 puts it, we now have access in one spirit to the Father. We are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. By now... But now, by grace, through faith, we can boldly approach the throne, whereas before we had no access. By faith in him, he has become our father who hears us and who draws us near. And it is vitally important to remember in our prayers because we don't have to be good enough to earn God's favor. We don't have to be polished or perfect. Rather, our access is because of Christ and we can come as we are Whenever I was in high school, uh, the main time in which I would be fervently praying was on the sideline of my football games. And I would be sitting there and I'd be like, God, please forgive me for all of my sin because this is happening and that's why we're down by three points and just let us do better. And I mean, like, truly, I'm sitting here just thinking this whole game hinges on, like, God's forgiveness of my sin. And I'm just feeling the weight of it. And so in that, though, like, I think a lot of us can sit here and think we need to be polished. We need to say it right or have this performance of it. Or we need to be, have done better for God to actually listen to our cries. But we need to understand the beauty of God in the grace of Jesus and his blood covering over our sin, hearing us. We get to come as we are. Paul Miller put it this way, the name of Jesus gives our prayers royal access. Asking in Jesus' name isn't another thing I have to get right so my prayers are perfect. It is one more gift of God because my prayers are so imperfect. It is one more gift of God because my prayers are so imperfect. Well, as the band comes up, I want to remind us of what we see in this passage. We see that we have a relationship with the one true God, the existing one, and he delights in hearing our requests. We see that we're poor and needy. We, like children, have needs and can turn to our Heavenly Father to supply those needs and His plans for this world. And and as we understand this relationship rightly, it will tear away any pretense from our prayers. It will have us bring requests ceaselessly to our Father who cares while submitting to His will because we know that He is good and true and loving and full of grace towards us. If you're anything like me, though, you've heard all these things and yet you feel convicted because you aren't seeking God in this way as children. You want to, but you're wrestling with cynicism. You brought requests to God and not have prayers answered. And those prayers have been for things that are good, things that you would expect him to delight in giving, and he does. But we wrestle with how can we keep bringing these requests to him over and over again. We've prayed for things through our life, not seen them answered. We feel distance or nothing when we pray. We find ourselves doubting the power and the importance of prayer. Possibly our mind is filled with doubt that God can truly restore our marriage, heal our bodies, provide the friendship that we long for, or change our child's heart. We can be so prone to be people of little faith 
So how can we cultivate childlikeness in our relationship with God? How can we truly see this transform our hearts? I want to give you a few different things that I think can help us take on this posture of children. Number one is just praying the Bible. As you open up the Bible, it will prompt you to pray. Have a mindset that considers as you're reading it, meditate on it, and actually begin asking those things to the Lord. You can be reading through the Gospels and you can praise God for the example of Jesus, for the grace and the power found through his life, death, and resurrection, and then pray that for your family or friends who do not know him. You can read of the foolishness of the disciples, but Jesus' gentleness towards them, and you can be filled with gratitude for his gentleness towards you in your sin and in your foolishness. We read of his healing power and reminded that he truly does have the power to heal, and we can pray boldly for friends, for others that are struggling with health issues. You read the epistles and we see Paul's prayers for those that are in the church that he loves dearly and desires them to grow in their spiritual maturity and their love for the Lord and their joy in him. And we are then prompted to pray those same things for people in our GC and church. So have a mindset that seeks to read these things and then turn them into prayers to God. Secondly, pray in the moment. When you ask people how they are doing or what's going on in their life, be willing to ask them if you can pray for them in that moment. It's going to feel really, really uncomfortable if you are not used to doing this. And it feels really uncomfortable at times when someone does pray for you in the moment. But it's something that is so good. It is so good. And many of us uh, will often leave those moments. We'll say that we'll pray for someone and we'll leave that moment and then we'll never actually pray. So why not pray then and there? to show the Father's love and care for that person in the moment. Pausing to pray in the moments too with our friends, children, spouses, coworkers, or strangers will humble our hearts and show a dependence on God. It will show that childlikeness. And it's the most powerful, loving thing we can do for them because we're calling on the God of all power, comfort, and truth to truly come and respond. Third, we get to remember and reflect. Reflection should also produce confession and repentance. As we remember who God is, it's going to humble our hearts to see our inability, our inadequacy like we covered before. See, the more I reflect on my days, the more aware I am of how much I need the Lord, how much I've strived in my own power, and how much I desire for His wisdom and truth and strength in my life rather than my own. And lastly, I encourage you to be patient and perseverant. Uh, When I first felt convicted that I wanted to grow in prayers because I heard someone use the example of Martin Luther in a teaching on prayer. And he famously said, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Well, I heard this teaching and I resolved that I would wake up the next morning at 5.30 a.m., go into my closet and pray for an hour. And what do you think happened? I fell asleep. (laughs) I fell asleep, but I did wake up feeling incredibly refreshed but also defeated. And so my encouragement for you is to truly take to heart this counsel to become to our Father as children. You'll need to be patient in the ways in which you stumble, the ways in which you don't turn to Him as you should, but I encourage you to persevere because it's worth it. There is such a great joy and peace and comfort from turning to our Father in this way. He wants to hear the big and the small, the things that you think are unimportant and those big things that feel weighty. He hears and He cares about it all. I want to conclude with another quote from Paul Miller. He said, What do I lose when I have a praying life? I lose control and independence. What do I gain? I gain friendship with God, a quiet heart, the living work of God in the hearts of those I love, the ability to roll back the tide of evil. Essentially, I lose my kingdom and get his. I move from being an independent player to a dependent lover. I move from being an orphan to a child of God. May we all walk out of here truly embodying this posture, understanding the reality that we are children of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the way that you draw near to us, the way you delight in us bringing our requests to you. We know that when we call, when we cry out, when we plea with you, that you answer, as we saw from David in this psalm, We know that you hear and we can trust in your goodness and your grace 
and your power. Father, we pray that we would lean into your love and bring all of our requests to you. You would help grow our awareness moment by moment, day by day of our need for you. And the smallest of things, with the breath we breathe, with our drives to work, every little thing is under your watchful care and your sovereignty. And so we pray that we would remember that we are not in control of anything. And that we would be quick to come to you in prayer for the big things too, depending on you and finding a peace that transcends all understanding. So may we run to our Father, to you, Father, rejoicing in your goodness to us, remembering your faithfulness towards us. And may it bolden, embolden us to pray fervently, perseverantly, believing with hope that you hear and that you will answer. And we do this in Jesus' name, by his grace, by his blood. It's in his name we pray, amen.